I am very proud to present Dr. Russell Blaylock. Uh, thank you. I appreciate the invitation. And what we're going to talk about today is a subject that uh, is not that well known, immunoexcitotoxicity. This is a culmination of work I've been doing probably for the last uh, 20 years. Um, hardly anyone is uh, aware of it, even in the field of clinical neurology, but in the neurosciences, it's a very intense, hot area of research. Basically, uh, I assume that at least you have some basic idea of excitotoxicity. That's why you're attending this lecture. But excitotoxicity is a process where the glutamate neurotransmission receptors are being overstimulated, and it produces a process of gradual destruction of the synaptic connections and the dendrites. It also results uh, in uh, eventual loss of the neuron if it's very intense. So what we're going to talk about is some of the things that excitotoxicity is associated with clinically. And as you see on this slide, it's associated with a great number of clinical disorders. Uh, beginning early in life, it has a major role to play in neurodegenerative disorders. That is uh, development of the brain, abnormal development of the brain, uh, things like Alzheimer's, uh, all the way up into Down syndrome, lysencephaly, uh, some of the major uh, abnormalities of brain development. Uh, then we see that there's uh, the common things that most of us are aware of, like Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, ALS, Huntington's disease. What we find in all these neurodegenerative diseases, the common denominator is an elevation in excitotoxicity in the brain. What I've uh, learned since then is that, in fact, in all of these disorders, there's an immune component that's very important, and that's what we're going to talk about. But also, there's glutamate receptors throughout the entire body, not just in the brain and, and uh, spinal cord. Uh, you have glutamate receptors in the lungs, in the endothelial lining of blood vessels, in all major organs, reproductive organs, uh, the pancreas, the beta cells. Every organ in the body has glutamate receptors. So we see it's connected with sudden, uh, sudden cardiac death. That is, when these glutamate receptors are overstimulated, particularly in the face of low magnesium, you'll develop sudden cardiac death. GI disorders, uh, lupus, autoimmune disorders that affect the brain and the nervous system, they're activating these, micro, these uh, uh, immune uh, and uh, glutamate receptors producing destruction of the nervous system, multiple sclerosis. Uh, atherosclerosis is playing a major role because it produces very high level uh, uh, inflammation in the wall of the blood vessel chronically, high free radical generation, lipid uh, peroxidation. Retinal disorders, like now we know that uh, glaucoma, the blindness is not caused by the pressure, it's caused by uh, excitotoxicity, uh, in particular immunoexcitotoxicity in the retina itself. Endocrine disorders, diabetes, uh, and we found that, in fact, it's also associated with tumor growth. Stimulating glutamate receptors on tumors cause uh, rapid invasion of the tumor and metastasis, and studies have shown it plays a major role uh, in the prognosis of all cancers. <clears throat> now, this was originally discovered by Dr. Uh, Lucas and Newhouse, who are uh, ophthalmology researchers. And they thought that glutamate would enhance the health of the retina because they thought glutamate was a fuel for the brain and neurons. But what they found is when they fed this glutamate to mice, it destroyed all the retinal cells in the, uh, along the inner layer of the retina. Ten years later, Dr. John Olnan, a neuroscientist, repeated this and found out that it also destroyed some very important areas of the brain. At that time, we didn't even know there was such a thing as a glutamate receptor in the brain. Glutamate was not known or accepted as a uh, neurotransmitter. Uh, since that time, we've discovered that, in fact, it is not only a neurotransmitter, but is the most common and one of the most important. Ninety percent of all transmission in the cortex of the brain is by glutamate. Fifty percent of all neurotransmission in the brain is by glutamate. 
which puts it far ahead of things like serotonin, dopamine, uh, acetylcholine, norepinephrine. And we also find that the glutamate receptors are playing a major role in control of the other uh, receptors as well. One of the things he discovered is that immature animals are infinitely more sensitive to this excitotoxicity than mature animals. And that uh, uh, there's this period of hypersensitivity from intrauterine life through the first two or three years of life that gradually declines until you become an adult. Then as you reach age 50 and above, the sensitivity begins to rise again. So you develop this hypersensitivity at the two extremes of life. We also notice, if you look at the same uh, schedule, the, the immune reaction in the brain early into your uterine is also hypersensitive. And as you really uh, begin to enter uh, the older age group, immune hyperactivity begins to occur again. So there's this parallel increase in immune sensitivity and in uh, excitotoxicity at the same time. Now, we know that if you feed uh, one of the forms of glutamate, oral glutamate, called monosodium glutamate of MSG to humans, they can develop very high blood levels, anywhere from 19-fold to as high as 50-fold elevations in blood glutamate. Now, it was thought in previous times that it did not penetrate the brain because of the blood-brain barrier. But the studies have shown, in fact, it does penetrate, particularly if you keep blood elevated, uh, glutamate levels elevated. Also, the brain is intrinsically producing its own glutamate under pathological conditions. One of the common uh, ones that we all are associated with is hypoglycemia. Uh, we used to think that hypoglycemia of the brain that would produce destruction of the neurons was secondary to the fact the brain was not getting its nutrition. But then they discovered if you block glutamate receptors, you block most of the toxicity of hypoglycemia. So when you have a low uh, brain glucose level, it causes the brain to pour out its glutamate, and you get very high brain glutamate levels. Now, this is some uh, the early study that Dr. Olney did. This is slices of the uh, hypothalamus, particularly in the area of the archaeate nucleus. And what it shows is that this is the normal-looking hypothalamus in that area. Within about two or three hours, you get uh, widespread edema and beginning destruction of these neurons. Here, this is filled with activated microglia that's uh, continuing the process. And then here, you see almost all the neurons have been destroyed in that part of the brain. This is with a dose of glutamate that's equal to what human beings consume every day. Now, one of the ways that this glutamate gets in the brain from the food is through what's called the circumventricular organs. These are places in the brain that have no blood-brain barrier, even in the adult. So if you keep your blood level elevated, what happens is it gradually seeps through these CVO areas and then diffuses out into the rest of the brain, producing elevated levels of glutamate. Well, if you have a normally functioning brain, the brain can regulate that so it's not that neurotoxic. But if you have a neurological disease or if you have a chronically inflamed brain or if you're hypoglycemic or you have a head injury or a stroke or a number of other conditions, that can greatly aggravate that excitotoxicity that occurs from intrinsic glutamate elevation. And one of the things that we see uh, is neuroendocrine effects of high levels of glutamate in the brain. The hypothalamus is quite sensitive. So not only are the releasing hormones decrease as the excitotoxins increase, but we see that the target organs are also uh, affected. They're atrophic. So if you give this to an animal early in life, they grow up with very atrophic thyroid gland, uh, uh, adrenal glands, etc., and, se and sexual uh, accessory glands. Uh, we also see in these animals, if you feed them MSG even a few doses early, is they develop gross obesity. And of course, uh, there's good evidence that the obesity that we're seeing in this country in our young people and insulin resistance is due to the uh, enormous exposure to dietary glutamate. Now, these are disorders that are now recognized as being related to excitotoxicity, or this process of damage. 
And we see it's a very long list, and it grows every day. And what we're essentially finding is that anything that upsets the homeostasis of the brain produces excitotoxicity. Uh, that is, that when the brain is disturbed, its cells begin to release its glutamate intrinsically, and brain glutamate levels rise. Anytime glutamate rises in the brain and there's overstimulation of these receptors, you get an intense free radical generation in the brain and lipid peroxidation. And you'll notice that this list of diseases or diseases that are associated with loss of either neurons or synapses or dendrites or all of these things. For instance, viral diseases of the central nervous system. Most viruses don't damage the nervous system directly. They cause the brain to overstimulate its uh, microglia, its immune cell. That secretes high levels of excitotoxin and immune factors, and that interaction is what actually produces the damage. If you block glutamate toxicity in viral diseases, it stops most of the damage. If you block both the immune overreactivity and the excitotoxicity, you have almost no damage. Uh, Lyme disease, that's how it produces this neurological problem, multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's. Uh, and some of the things that, are, that people are not that aware of, it's a strong connection to autism, uh, mercury poisoning. Most of mercury's effect on the brain is due to its triggering of immunoexcitotoxicity. If you block immunoexcitotoxicity in the brain, mercury loses a lot of its toxic effect. Then only in very high concentrations will it be toxic. Same thing with lead toxicity, aluminum. Uh, brain injuries, strokes, uh, seizures. Uh, now most of the drugs are being developed are drugs that reduce excitotoxicity because that seems to be what's actually driving the seizure. Now, when we look at glutamate receptors in the brain, it is the most complex of all the neurotransmission receptors. I won't go through it now because we have a very short lecture period. But it is such an intense uh, area of study now. We now realize that virtually all neurological diseases, disorders, brain trauma, uh, the pathology is related to the act overactivation of these glutamate receptors. This is the basic uh, mechanism by which it's producing the excitotoxicity. And this is the uh, membrane of the neuron. This is outside the neuron and inside. And what happens is when the glutamate interacts with its uh, calcium channel receptor, it opens up the calcium channel. Calcium pours into the neuron, and it's in such high concentration it activates prostaglandins. The prostaglandin produces high levels of free radicals inside the neuron, and it uh, triggers an inflammatory cascade at the same time. The free radicals then uh, are interacting. The calcium activates inducible nitric oxide synthase. That activates uh, uh, nitric, uh, nitric oxide production, which interacts with superoxide free radical to produce a very powerful free radical called peroxynitrite. The peroxynitrite is a powerful inhibitor of mitochondrial function. When the mitochondrion does not produce sufficient en energy, the cell becomes hypersensitive to glutamate. So even in that situation, normal concentrations of glutamate can be toxic. So we see that once you suppress the mitochondrion by this process, you really get a cascading effect and, and a worsening uh, process. Now, what glutamate is doing in this case, and mainly we're talking about intrinsic release of glutamate, not what's in your diet, but what it's doing primarily, the glutamate is affecting the cell membrane, that is the synaptic membrane itself. It causes a reduction in the phosphatidylcholine, phosphatidylserine, and acetal, all these phospholipids. It dramatically increases the production of pro-inflammatory cosinoids, uh, and it produces microglial activation, which is the primary uh, immune cell of the brain. So anytime you have excitotoxicity, you have activation of microglia. The microglia is the primary source of the glutamate, that and the astrocyte. When the microglia is activated, it activates the astrocyte and begins to release this glutamate. That damages the DNA, increases energy demand of the cell, and brings about death by activation P53. 
And as we see, this accumulation of calcium inside the cell caused by the activation of this glutamate receptor suppresses mitochondrial function, and that uh, magnifies this toxic effect. So this is a very complex process that is triggered. Now, at the center of this is the microglia. Normally in the brain, the microglia are asleep. We call it the resting or ramified microglia. It's not really asleep. What the microglia at that stage is doing is releasing neurotrophic factors. That is, it's improving the health and protecting the synapse, the neuron, dendrite, the axon. <clears throat> but any time there's disturbance of the brain from any reason, the microglia becomes rapidly activated. In its activated state, it has a whole repertoire of activation. When it's activated, uh, and these are just the different things that can activate a microglia, and you can see it's virtually anything. When it activates the microglia, it begins to have an outpouring of arachidonic acid, which is increasing your prostaglandins. Glutamate is secreted by the microglia in large concentrations. Quinolinic acid, which is a metabolic product of serotonin, uh, which is a very powerful excitotoxin and a number of inflammatory and anti-inflammatory cytokines. Uh, the balance between inflammatory and inflammatory cytokines determines whether you have permanent damage or this is just a transient effect. <clears throat> now, with natural infections, when the microglia is activated and it kills a microorganism, once the organism is dead, the microglia switches to a reparative phase. And so the damage that was done and the process of killing this microorganism switches and starts repairing the damage that was done. But what we're learning, there are certain conditions in which the microglia apparently gets stuck in, in the own position. And what that means is the microglia continues to secrete high levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines, uh, fewer anti-inflammatory cytokines, and very high levels of these uh, of excitotoxins, quinolinic acid, and glutamate. Now, in the case of some diseases, what this is doing is producing a chronic process of neurodegeneration. The reason it's producing the neurodegeneration is because all of these excitotoxins, and this is some of the major ones that are released uh, and this, by this microglial activation, the pro-inflammatory cytokines are released. It produces high levels of free radicals and lipid peroxidation products in the brain and high levels of excitatory amino acids in a cascading fashion. That is, the more free radicals, the more you get a release of glutamate. Uh, and eventually what this is going to result in is neurodegeneration. This seems this immunoexcitotoxic reaction appears to be what's occurring in Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease, ALS, multiple sclerosis, brain trauma, strokes, we see this same central process occurring in each of these diseases and disorders. And when you do experiments on animals in which you reproduce, for instance, stroke models or Alzheimer's models, and you block immunoexcitotoxicity, much of the damage stops or, or never occurs. So it appears to be a central mechanism by which the brain is damaged, far exceeds everything else we've looked at. And there's silent brain lesions that can occur from this process. That is, you're not aware it's occurring. And it's a general uh, understanding in neuroscience that until you lose about 70 to 80 percent of neurons in a nucleus, you really have no clinical signs. We see this, for instance, in uh, Parkinson's disease. Uh, in the substantia nigra, until you lose about 70 percent of the neurons, you have no symptoms of Parkinson's disease. So this silent neurodegenerative process is occurring over decades. The clinical appearance is in that last group of 20 to 30 percent of neurons that are left. And so when you start treating uh, Parkinson's disease, you're treating the endpoint. Uh, the idea is to start treating this before you ever get to that stage. And we realize that in most of these neurodegenerative diseases, it's not death of the neurons that's the main early process. It's the loss of synapses and dendrites. And that if you stop this process early, you can regrow dendrites in the synapses that are damaged. So you have a window of opportunity uh, 
uh, to reverse this damage before it gets to the point at which it's destroying the neuron itself. This is the hippocampus, another area of the brain that's really hypersensitive to this immunoexcitotoxic reaction. And what happens is you start losing the population of cells and there's associated with memory, attention, and behavior. Uh, that occurs just like it does in, in substantia uh, nigra. You really don't notice a lot of symptoms until you've lost about 60 to 70 percent of these neurons or the synaptic connection. At that point, you begin to have trouble with your memory, your orientation, ability to concentrate, early mental uh, fatigue, easy mental fatigue. Then uh, you start to treat it clinically. You're treating, uh, trying to save the last 30 to 40 percent of cells that are already sick. So our idea is to uh, try to start this process before. Now, I wanted to say a word about the, the observation of the uh, gross obesity with exposure to dietary glutamate. Uh, when Dr. Olney first did his studies, his uh, research assistant came up to him and said, Dr. Olney, have you noticed all the mice we're giving this MS MSG to as infants are ending up grossly obese? And he said he'd never noticed, and he went back and looked at them, and they were huge. I have some pictures of them uh, drawing in my book showing the, the difference. And so they repeated in all animal species, and all of them developed gross obesity. And uh, they noticed that there were certain char characteristics of this obesity. And you may notice this is what we're seeing in our youth and even our adult population. The animals tend to eat less often, uh, but they ate faster. They chose high-carbohydrate foods over nutritious foods. It's very difficult to exercise this weight off. They develop insulin resistance, and they have abnormal lipid profiles. So it looks just exactly what we're seeing uh, in this uh, epidemic of gross obesity we're seeing now. Well, one thing that we're doing in this society, our processed food virtually all has added glutamate to it. Not just as MSG, but they allow to disguise it, but the federal government says they can disguise it any name they want to as long as it's less than 99% pure glutamate. So what they call is hydrolyzed protein, caseinate, enzymes, autolyzed yeast, uh, uh, protein concentrate, protein isolates, soy protein isolates. They have all these disguised names, carrageenans, uh, broth, stock. All these are very high and can produce the very same damage that you can get from pure MSG. So as humans, we're eating three, four times a day, snacking uh, between uh, with all this junk food that's absolutely filled with this glutamate. Now, humans are five times more sensitive to glutamate brain toxicity than any known animal species. Uh, we're 20 times more sensitive than the rhesus monkey. So we have uh, the unfortunate position of being the most sensitive of any known living organism to the brain effects of this uh, excitotoxin. And it appears that it's early life exposure to this that's producing uh, this gross obesity for a lifetime and this uh, uh, syndrome we know as metabolic syndrome. And exposure to MSG early in life will produce the exact metabolic syndrome. And it's a lifetime effect. Uh, we have so many of these products that are now uh, containing it. They contain multiple forms of it. The liquid forms of it are much more damaging than the solid forms because they're rapidly absorbed and you get higher blood levels. Uh, we also know that some of these sulfites can be converted, converted into some very powerful excitotoxins like cysteine S, uh, sulfonic acid, uh, sulfenic acid, all of these things are very powerful excitotoxins that we find in our food. We know that when you expose uh, animals early in life to this <coughs> product, they have changes in their hypothalamus that persist for a lifetime. And not just the hypothalamus, but the amygdala, the cortex, prefrontal cortex. All these areas undergo changes that are lifetime. Now, that's the immune part of immune cytotoxicity. When you prime an immune cell in the brain, the microglia, it makes the cell hyperreactive, but not just for a short period, but for a lifetime. So that if decades later you're exposed again immunologically, that cell 
overproduces immune uh, cytokines, inflammatory cytokines, and high levels of glutamate, much more than normal. Each time you undergo immune stimulation, you get a an, an ramping up of that microglial activity. Well, if you look at a normal situation, most of us are getting viruses, getting colds, exposed to mercury, exposed to pesticides regularly throughout life. All those things are known to activate microglia. So we're undergoing repetitive microglial activation throughout a lifetime, and it ramps up as we get older. Now, one of the effects of aging is that as you age, the inflammatory content of the brain begins to rise. That's a natural effect. Your microglia become more active as you age. Now, in most people with healthy brains, that's no problem. But in some people who have either diseases pre-existing in their brain, even though they don't know it, if you do that, then the microglia secrete very large uh, levels of inflammatory cytokines, very high levels of excitotoxins. They're the ones who develop Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, ALS, and these other degenerative brain diseases, uh, you know, the adult onset uh, uh, cognitive difficulties. If we look at multiple sclerosis uh, as an example of a, an immune disease, we see something interesting is that the, the, this priming process is very important. We think a virus or possibly a pesticide exposure primes the microglia in the white matter. And that later, every time you get activation of your immune system systemically, vaccination, exposure to viruses, bacteria, uh, pesticides, herbicides, heavy metals, every time you're exposed, you're making these cells hyperreactive. And so that eventually produces destruction of the white matter pass, uh, and you get multiple uh, sclerosis changes. Now, when you look at multiple sclerosis and measure the glutamate and aspartate levels in the spinal fluid, you know MS initially is a uh, relapsing, remitting uh, disease in which there's activity of the disease, and it falls off for years after the first attack, and then you get another attack, and then they get closer together. Uh, this rise and fall of, of activity of the disease, you have a parallel rise of glutamate and fall of glutamate with each attack. And if you graph it out, when you look at the, the red bar graph, the high level is that's when you get a lot of glutamate, and that's when the disease is most active. When it falls during remission, glutamate levels fall, and the activity of the disease falls. The rise in the glutamate precedes the activity of the disease, showing that it's causing the relapse and not a result of the relapse. And so we see this process repetitively occurring throughout most of MS. Well, one of the really uh, puzzling things that occurred with MS was that the patients eventually, uh, they burn out this immune overreactivity. So their immune system quits attacking the nervous system. But then they go into a chronic neurodegenerative phase in which they get worse and worse and worse and worse, and there's no periods uh, of, of uh, remission. And uh, if you graphed it out, that's your, your blue graphs here, you see glutamate levels remain high. They never go back down. And so the microglia at that point can quit secreting high levels of inflammatory cytokines, but they continue secreting high levels of excitotoxins. So this is an example of this interaction of this immunoexcitotoxicity. If we look at our neurodegenerative diseases, we see there's a lot of common factors. Uh, there's high levels of free radical generation, high lipid peroxidation. Uh, 4-HNE is one of the most powerful for, uh, lipid peroxidation products, and uh, it causes elevation of brain glutamate. High levels of iron, which is a powerful trigger for free radical generation in the brain. Uh, with these diseases, the brain starts accumulating iron. Uh, aluminum is a powerful generator of free radicals and activator of microglia. Mercury activate microglia, elevate brain glutamate. Uh, magnesium is low. Magnesium is a natural inhibitor of glutamate excitotoxicity. And magnesium reduces brain inflammation. So when it's low, the brain becomes progressively more inflamed and you have a greater secretion of the excitotoxins. Glutathione isn't low in all of these diseases. It's your major protection against uh, amino excitotoxicity. 
homocysteine is elevated. Now, homocysteine is an excitotoxin, particularly its metabolic products. And a lot of people that talk about homocysteine are not aware of what a powerful uh, uh, excitotoxin it is, particularly when it's metabolized in a homocysteine sulfenic acid. I'm going to switch some of these things uh, and get to what you should do during our last few minutes here. Uh, because this is an interaction of the immune system of the brain and the excitotoxic system of the brain, they're connected, they're occurring at the same time. You've got to reduce the inflammation and you've got to re reduce the excitotoxicity if you want to stop the degenerative process. Well, uh, a couple of things you want to concentrate on. And what we know is that in all cases of immunoexcitotoxicity, there are high levels of brain-free radical generation. So you want antioxidant protection. Uh, we know that there's depleted mitochondrial function. So you want to increase the energy production of neurons. That greatly enhances their protection. You want to improve detoxification. Uh, because when you can't detoxify pesticides or herbicides well, then they become more neurotoxic. Same thing for mercury. And you want to avoid these, high, these metal toxins like mercury, lead, aluminum, fluoride, uh, fluor, aluminum, pesticides, herbicides. All these things are things that activate immunoexcitotoxicity uh, in the brain. So one thing you want to do, <clears throat> you want to increase your antioxidant enzyme uh, levels in your brain. Well, melatonin not only helps you sleep, but it elevates uh, the antioxidant enzymes in the brain, like superoxide dismutase, catalase, uh, glutathione reductase, are all increased by melatonin. Uh, we know that melatonin also suppresses excitotoxicity in the brain. Curcumin is a very powerful anti-inflammatory, and it's a very powerful antioxidant particularly for 4-HNE, which is a very powerful uh, lipid peroxidation product. The other antioxidants like vitamin C and E have no effect on 4-HNE and many of the lipid peroxidation products. Uh, zinc and selenium is important. You don't want to overdo zinc because it can be neurotoxic. Selenium can neutralize mercury toxicity to the brain and fluoride toxicity to the brain and possibly lead. Selenium is very, very important for the brain. Uh, your vitamins, uh, of course, they're all antioxidants. They need to be taken in combination. Uh, your flavonoids, the most powerful antioxidant for brain, are quercetin, curcumin, her uh, spiritin, uh, elagic acid, resveratrol, uh, arlipoic acid. All these things are extremely powerful protectants for the brain and reduce immunoexcitotoxicity damage. Magnesium is very, very important. You want to increase energy production by the brain. So things like pyruvate, malate, creatine, uh, creatine uh, uh, pyruvate, all elevate uh, energy production in brain cells. And as I said, when the energy is increased, it's highly protective against excitotoxicity. A C-lyl carnitine will bind excess iron <clears throat> in the brain and help reduce free radical generation. Uh, it stimulates energy production by the mitochondrion. Uh, it reduces uh, seizure threshold, uh, th uh, seizure uh, occurrence by raising the threshold. Arlipoic acid is very powerful. It also helps uh, prevent excitotoxicity directly, and that's been shown in a number of studies. Ginkgo biloba, both the ginkaloid components and quercetin, which is very high in ginkgo biloba, are protective. Uh, Venpocetine has been shown to directly block uh, excitotoxicity. Your B vitamins for energy, uh, particularly uh, B1 uh, riboflavin, uh, pyridoxine 5-phosphate, and niacinamide. And taurine is the brain's neuromodulator. So uh, basically what you, ne you need to take away from here is that we're discovering that immunoexcitotoxicity process is the most important uh, process and virtually anything can happen to the nervous system. It is automatically triggered. There's evidence that in some people and under some pathologic conditions, it's activated, cannot turn off.
and that there's evidence that doing these things, protective things that I've talked about, may be able to shut it off. For instance, like selamarin has been shown to be very powerful at low doses in shutting down microglia overactivity, and that shuts down a lot of the immunoexcitotoxicity. By combining all of these things, you get the greatest effect. There's synergism between them. Avoid these excitotoxins in the diet is very important, because if you already have this process occurring, you don't want to keep fueling it by the excitotoxins inside of your diet. Some foods naturally contain high levels of glutamate, like meats, particularly red meats are very high in glutamate. When you cook meats, the juices are extremely high in glutamate. It's just like liquid MSG. That's why it tastes so good when you put it on your food. Tomatoes, when they're pureed, have high glutamate levels. Parmesan cheese is very high in glutamate. All cheeses generally have elevated glutamate. Uh, so there's natural foods, and we know in ALS, for instance, if you feed them those foods, their blood level is twice as high as normal. Uh, so they have a particular concentrating ability just from eating natural foods with glutamate. So you need to reduce your intake of protein foods. Uh, I'm against all of this protein uh, consumption that's, that's very popular now because most of those are very high in glutamate, aspartic acid, Glycine, all of which are, are excitotoxins. You should eat a moderate amount of protein, lots of flavonoids and fruits and vegetables. Avoid fluor, fluoride uh, and aluminum. Uh, drinking water has fluoride and aluminum in it. Uh, it's, it's naturally added to the water. It forms a fluoraluminum compound, which activates G proteins, which is, is the activating component of metabotropic glutamate receptors. So uh, if you watch your diet, and you take a few supplements to neutralize these effects as you get older, take the melatonin, uh, you can significantly reduce your risk of immunoexcitotoxicity. And as I said, these neurodegenerative diseases start decades before any clinical symptoms arise. So that period of opportunity is quite long, and that's when we need to start preventing these diseases. If you wait until you already have the symptoms, you're fighting to save that last 20 to 30 percent of cells that are already sick. So at that point, I'm going to terminate the discussion. It's a lot more involved in this, but in 40 minutes, you, you can't cover that much. But I think you've got the gist of uh, what's involved. <clears throat>